Hey guys, it's Greg from BitGobbled again, and since I started this channel, I've taken a look at several different Linux distributions over that time, most notably Debian and Linux Mint. And while Linux is cool and all, and it's really, really good at what it does, I want to show you all FreeBSD, since it's another Unix-like free and open source operating system that has a lot to offer. Honestly, it's really not that great as a desktop operating system when compared to Windows, Mac OS, or even Linux. Spoiler alert, but it's still great at a bunch of other use cases, and either way, we're here today to look at the latest stable release of FreeBSD, version 13.0, uh, so I can show you all what it has to offer, and later on we'll discuss its differences with Linux. You smell that? It smells like a bit goblin. Now, before we start talking about FreeBSD, I know not all of you will watch to the very end, where I normally reach out to you all for your input. So I'll mention now that I've had some recurring issues with FreeBSD that I would like help solving. If you'd like to be awesome and help out, I'd appreciate it if you can head down to the timestamp shown here to see what my problems are and pitch in. So, FreeBSD, what is it and where did it come from? I don't want to go too deep into the weeds here since there's a lot to read if you're interested, but FreeBSD's history actually dates back several years prior to that of Linux. It originated from the Berkeley Software Distribution, or BSD, which was originally based on Research Unix and over a few iterations of BSD with a lawsuit mixed in there uh, from AT&T over six source files. Eventually, FreeBSD sprouted in 1993 and has developed into a very solid OS since then. Nowadays, FreeBSD is the most well-known of the BSD lineage. Other popular ones are NetBSD, which focuses on portability across many platforms, and OpenBSD, which focuses on stability and security. But FreeBSD's focus on being a general purpose OS makes it very flexible, and you'll find it in many places. Netflix uses FreeBSD for their servers, Sony uses it as the OS in their PlayStations, and if you've heard of TrueNAS, formerly FreeNAS, FreeBSD is the base OS that IX Systems builds upon for that. It truly is amazing that it can be used for something as large as server clusters and supercomputers, all the way down to things like a desktop for an office suite or web browsing or whatever. Now, in comparison to Linux, and in this context by Linux, I'm referring to Linux distributions and its surrounding ecosystem as a whole, not just the kernel, FreeBSD is another open source Unix-like operating system that finds its home in servers as the base OS for devices, and lesser so on the desktop. This general similarity is why these two get compared a lot, and we'll talk more about some similarities and differences later in the video. But for now, I'm just going to show you all how to get FreeBSD up and running with a desktop environment. So right here we're in the FreeBSD installer and getting here is actually very similar to that of a Linux installer. Just download the ISO image right to a flash drive with a tool like DD or Rufus, reboot your machine, and select your flash drive as the boot device. If you've gone through text-based installers before, then this will be nothing new to you, but if you haven't, then there's no need to fret since it's pretty easy. You start off with simple things like setting the keyboard layout and locale and then the system host name. Next, you need to select which system components to install, and for now, the defaults will do us just fine. Now we need to get the network configured, so hit OK, select your NIC, enable IPv4, and we'll use DHCP for this machine. I don't use IPv6 locally, so let's decline that. This screen just confirms some details for your networking setup. Usually, this will fill out with a proper search domain and some DNS servers, but since we're in a VM, it's normal for this to be very bare. We can use the default FreeBSD mirror, and now we're at the file system setup. Unless you have a reason not to, I'd recommend just sticking with the guided ZFS option. This window spells out the details for our file system, which we can just accept, and since we only have one disk, we should select the ZFS stripe layout. Press space to select our virtual disk, then accept the warning letting us know that our disk will be wiped. Now it shall start installing, so go grab yourself a coffee or whatever and enjoy yourself while it does its thing. Now the install will start, so go grab yourself a coffee or whatever you prefer, and enjoy yourself while this installer does its thing. Alright, now that the base OS has finished installing, we need to configure it. First, we're prompted twice for a root password, so enter that now. Next, select your time zone. I'll do America, then USA, then Eastern, and confirm. We can skip the time and date section unless you want to set it manually. This services section isn't too important, as you'd usually configure things like NTP, Unbound, and SSH through something like Salt or Puppet, but if you want to do this here, you can just scroll down and then press space to select NTP or whatever you prefer. This next window asks us for common system hardening tricks. You can read through these and enable them as you prefer, but for now we can just accept this as is, since the defaults are just fine. 
Though I'll mention for server deployments, I usually select all of these except for the disable syslog option. Moving on, we're prompted to add a user. So let's hit yes and start filling out our user info. This is incredibly verbose. There's like a million different things to prompt you for, but all you really need to fill out is a username for which I'll use Bitcoblin. Then accept all the defaults until you're prompted for a password twice. Accept the rest of the defaults and then enter yes to accept the new user. Finally, we're finished, so let's hit exit, decline opening a shell for more tweaks, and select reboot. Congratulations, you've just installed FreeBSD. So, by default, FreeBSD starts without a GUI, and you get thrown into a text console just like the one you see on screen now. This is not a bad thing, I promise. It's very bare bones, much in the same vein as Arch Linux, where you can build your own OS from the ground up. You literally just get a base system with only the required utilities to boot up and start configuring your system. So if you want to use a GUI, then you'll need to install it, and I will show you how to do so using the Mate desktop environment as an example. First, let's install the packages required by running package, or pkg, install, xorg, lightdm, lightdm-gtk-greeter, mate, mate-desktop, and vim. You'll first get asked to install the pkg package manager, hit y and enter, and this is because, like I said, FreeBSD is very bare bones, so it doesn't ship with the package manager by default, though you can easily install it like you see here. And then eventually you'll get prompted to accept the install of a bunch of packages. Enter Y and you'll start seeing all this stuff install. Now we need to enable some services so our system knows to start with a desktop environment. So we need to edit the slash etsy slash rc.conf file to enable these services. You can open slash etsy slash rc.conf in Vim or whatever your preferred text editor is, and then add these lines. dbus underscore enable equals yes. cald underscore enable equals yes. mouse d underscore enable equals yes. And then lightdm underscore enable equals yes. While we're here, it's very important that you double check your syntax here and make sure everything is correct. If you mess something up, like forgetting a quote, uh, forgetting an equal sign, or disabling the ZFS like we see here, uh, you can actually break your system. So just be very careful and make sure you don't make a mistake. Really, if you do make a mistake, it's not too hard to correct. It's just it's kind of annoying. Anyways, we can now save and exit the file. So at this point, the desktop should be ready so we can reboot our system. And if everything went well, we should be met with the LightDM login screen. Once we log in as our user, the Monte desktop should come up just like we normally would see on any Linux distribution. And from here, we can further install packages like LibreOffice, Firefox, Clementine Player, VLC, or whatever else you might use on your desktop machine. All right, while I just showed you all that you can set up regular old FreeBSD with a desktop environment, I really wouldn't recommend this unless you prefer the DIY approach of building your desktop from scratch. Instead, I'd recommend going with either GhostBSD or MidnightBSD since those ship a desktop environment already configured with all the bells and whistles you might expect from something like an Ubuntu Mate or Zubuntu. But even then, unless you really want to use FreeBSD as your desktop OS for whatever reason, like you're a developer or it just makes you happy to run FreeBSD, then I'd recommend sticking with Linux for your desktop since a lot of the software that is available for FreeBSD is also available for Linux since a lot of it is open source stuff like Firefox, Thunderbird, LibreOffice, etc. Plus, Linux has made a lot of strides on the desktop in recent years, especially in terms of gaming. Or, more generally speaking, I'd just recommend most people run Windows or Mac OS for your desktop, unless you have a need for Linux or just want to use open source software. Where FreeBSD really does shine, though, is on the server, and also as a base to build a commercial product, which we'll talk about in a little bit when we get to licensing. FreeBSD is developed as a complete system with a mostly clear division between what they call the base system and user space. The base system includes everything that is considered necessary to run a base system. Things like the kernel, drivers, shells, and low-level utilities like ls and cd commands. And this all gets updated together as a unit periodically through major and minor fixed releases like 12.0, 13.0, and 13.1. The FreeBSD team also take this a step further where they pretty much refuse to release a minor release if it breaks the ABI that was shipped in the related major release. This means that software that was built against version 12.0 will work in 12.1, 12.2, and so forth. User space applications, on the other hand, are updated more freely and contains the rest of the software that you may want to install on your system. This includes things like desktop environments and the X11 display server, web browsers, word processors, email clients, games, music, and video apps, etc. 
These will usually be installed through the package manager or the port system and aren't maintained as tightly with the base system. This setup allows for less critical applications to be more up to date so you can get newer features and improvements, but your software should still work without issue when you update your system and you still have a solid base to target for software development if that matters to you. This is all in contrast to Linux though, where everything is kind of cobbled together from multiple sources and is treated all the same in user space. This keeps everything very simple and easy to maintain since you really only need to run one command to update your system and install packages. But this does require more complex solutions if, say, you want to have your kernel and system utilities to be stable, but have your web server or database server on newer releases. Neither of these approaches are necessarily better than the other. There are certainly pros and cons to each, but FreeBSD's approach strikes a nice balance in my opinion. FreeBSD's networking stack is legendary for its performance in high traffic situations. This is the reason FreeBSD is the operating system of choice for companies like Netflix that need to push as much data as possible from their systems over the network. When you're pushing 100 gigabits per second or more from one system, Every little performance optimization makes a big impact when trying to get the most out of your hardware. But that being said, Linux performs just fine in this regard, and this is also one of those things that's not really going to matter for most people. In Netflix's case, where you're serving incredibly large amounts of data uh, for video, yeah, it makes sense to make the switch. If you're just serving a website for a small business, maybe you should focus on improving your internal processes or scaling up your business or whatever. Another positive point for FreeBSD is the lack of systemd. Now, this can be very limiting when it comes to using newer desktop environments like GNOME that rely on systemd very heavily, but to a lot of people, not having to deal with systemd is a very big positive. Personally, I have mixed feelings about systemd. I love it as a service manager, and I do appreciate that it standardizes a lot of the low-level stuff like logging, DNS, and time syncing across Linux distributions but I would be lying if I said I haven't run into numerous issues with several of these other utilities. The main ones I can think of are journalD just randomly stopping with no indication whatsoever that it has failed, and system logs essentially just being dropped into the ether, and also the time date CTL tool just not keeping several systems local time in sync with the server, with again without any indication why. SystemD feels like it's trying to do too much sometimes, and for me, for desktop usage, it's okay, but in production deployments, I would rather just not have to deal with it. All right, now let's talk about the elephant in the room, licensing. The reason this is big is because Linux, or at least the Linux kernel, uses the GNU General Public License version 2 or GPLv2, and FreeBSD uses a BSD license, or more specifically, the BSD2 clause license. The reason this is important is because even though they're both considered open source licenses, the GPL is considered a copyleft license where it requires any derivative of the work to use the same license and thus be open source and also follow a bunch of other restrictions about redistribution of the work. But the BSD licenses are permissive and allow you to use whatever license you want for derivative works so long as you follow the, in this case, two clauses in the license, which is basically just that you must retain the copyright notice of the work and carry on the disclaimer that basically just makes the copyright holder not liable for any problems caused by the software. That was a lot of gibberish, but in other words, if you were to fork a software that uses the GPL license, you would have to then license your work using a GPL license as well. But if you were to fork software that has a BSD license, you can then license your code however you want, so long as you, again, follow the clauses that are in the license. This is why you can find FreeBSD as the base OS in PlayStations, even up to the latest PlayStation 5, uh, QNAPs, QES for their NAS systems, and in the enterprise space, Juniper's JunoS for their switches. They can make whatever modifications they want to the operating system, sell their product, and not have to worry about violating any license restrictions by not redistributing the source code of their changes. And while this may sound bad at first glance with companies just, you know, taking FOSS code for their products and, you know, making money off of it, the neat thing about this is that a lot of the companies that do use FreeBSD in their products do in fact circle back to contribute and upstream their changes, which then of course allows everyone else to benefit from those changes. And as a small note, this is also why for so long FreeBSD and I believe the other BSDs as well were able to ship ZFS with their systems, but Linux distros had to avoid it. It was because ZFS uses the CDDL license, which was incompatible with the GPL. In retrospect, now that a lot of Linux distributions ship ZFS with their OS, this was kind of silly, but this was a problem for a while. Okay, so that was all a lot to take in, and there are tons of other things to dive into, like Jails, which is FreeBSD's equivalent to Docker, kinda. 
uh, the port system, which gets you access to tons of software and lets you build it how you want it, and their Beehive virtualization system. But now I'd like to talk about my thoughts on FreeBSD and whether or not I use it. I don't use FreeBSD on my desktop machines since I use several apps that don't run or at least don't run well on FreeBSD. My video editor of choice is DaVinci Resolve. I play lots of games through Steam. Uh, my favorite game, OS Arrest, doesn't have a client for FreeBSD. And yeah, there's a few more stuff as well. As for in my home lab, if you include my one system that has been running uh, True or FreeNAS for several years, and my firewall that's been running uh, OpenSense for, gosh, like four years now, I only have a few systems that run FreeBSD. I have had phases before where I'm like, let's go all FreeBSD for my servers, and I start migrating systems over, and I'm happy because it integrates with my infrastructure well, just like Linux. You know, I feel cool and nerdy for a while, but I always run into weird quirks, like trouble mounting SMB shares using SMB2 or 3 protocols, or I still have to run Linux systems because Docker doesn't run, or at least doesn't run well on FreeBSD. There's just always something that comes up. And that leads us very well back into my call out for audience help from you guys from earlier. I have a few problems I would like help in solving. So first up, I can't seem to figure out how to mount SMB shares using the SMB v2 or v3 protocols. As far as I can tell, the SMBFS mount utility only supports version 1 shares, and of course these days that's just not recommended to do and is incredibly unsafe. Another thing I would like help with is figuring out FreeBSD's automated install process. I'm looking for something along the lines of a Red Hat Kickstart or Debian Preseed file where I just host a text file on a web server that has answers to all the installer's questions. All I found is either doing this through a Pixie boot environment, uh, which seems a little excessive for my home lab, or creating a local installation image with an install.config file. I'm not really against doing either of those, I'm just hoping for something a little bit simpler if it exists. Or at least hopefully there's an easy way to modify a FreeBSD installation image. The last question I have is, is there a way to tell the FreeBSD update tool to automatically keep the current version of config files instead of having me manually edit the diffs on every file that changed? It's really nice when I'm running updates on Debian-based systems that apps will prompt me to either keep the local file, install the new version of the config file, or let me edit it and I can just type N plus enter to get through it really quickly. If you can help me out with any of those problems, I would be very appreciative. I'll give you a digital high five or a hug or whichever you prefer. But even if you can't help me out, feel free to head down there to the comment section just below the video and leave us your thoughts on FreeBSD. I know it's not as glamorous as Linux, nor as widely used as Windows, but I like hearing and talking about nerdy stuff like FreeBSD. And if it's something that you use or have used before, I'm all ears. If you disliked the video, then you know what to do, but if you did like it, then go hit that like button and consider getting subscribed and hitting the bell icon so you can keep up with my latest videos. I've also got a Discord server if you'd like to join the community and just chat and hang out with us, or if you need it, you can head to one of the help channels to, well, get help. I hope you all have a great day, and I'm going to catch you in the next one.